Good morning. It's a great honor and privilege to be here as part of this global dialogue um, on sustainable development. And I look forward to very stimulating conversations throughout the day. It's particularly fitting that this dialogue is being held in Thailand, because in my view, Thailand is a role model for attempting to transform mindsets towards sustainable development at the national level. And I think many of us realize how challenging it is to change mindsets in small groups like families and our organizations. So it's a great privilege to be here in Thailand and to witness and see what is happening here. Mm -hmm. Technology is great when it works, there we are. So what are we going to talk about this morning? Well, uh, briefly looking at our sustainable futures, which are under threat, and I'm sure we're all aware of that this morning. But it is quite clear as Dr. Hazer said, that we can all help. So we're going to have a look at some stakeholder groups and their contributions both to the problem and to the solution. The group that I would like to focus on this morning, because that's the main group that uh, our institute researches, is business. And I think we all know that business has a great deal of power and influence that it can use, hopefully for good. Now, we can have various reasons for business to want to do this, but we're go I'm going to talk about some of our research and our findings, which clearly show that one can operate in self-interest in driving sustainable development and sustainable thinking and practices. It leads to better outcomes. In the process, we should be examining our value systems, and we'll have a look at three of those this morning. In a nutshell, I'm going to advise you if you're running an organization of any kind, business or otherwise, to be a honeybee rather than a locust. It's not biology, but it's the terms that we use for different leadership styles. And then we will conclude by seeing that we can all contribute in different ways. Um, the, the need for us to consider the planet and society is not new. In fact, sometimes when I see some of the problems of our world, knowing how long we have known about those problems, I get quite disappointed and more than that frustrated and distressed. And I have here a little quote from John F. Kennedy. He was assassinated in 1963 and obviously this was um, mentioned before he died. And he said in this speech, for in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet we all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's futures, and we are all mortal. So we have been aware, we have known for at least 50 years that we should be doing something uh, about our environment and our society, but we have done relatively little. Now, there's been some talk this morning about the Millennium Goals from the United Nations, and so I'd just like to highlight a few of these um, because uh, you might be interested in just knowing what some of them are. Um, obviously, there, is, there are the global climate issues, and that to me is absolutely fundamental, because if we humans don't rescue our home, our habitat, then um, I don't know that we're going to exist for very long. Uh, okay. um, clean water is, of course, very important. Another one is the pressure on our resources coming from our growing population. And one of the goals that is reasonably um, close to my heart is the notion of short-term thinking. That many of our politicians, many of our business people, and indeed many of us think of the short-term benefits that we might get from uh, our actions, but fail to think of the long-term consequences. And that then has consequences for the world and for the environment and for society. We've heard about the growing gap between the rich and the poor, and closing that gap is another millennium goal. Health, access to health, basic fundamental rights uh, are very poorly distributed. Conflicts, we saw in the video, I think that drove home very much. The wasted resources, the wasted human potential from conflicts. Energy, 
we need to focus on renewable energies. We need to get away from our fossil fuels. It's another major millennium goal. But one which I would like to pause at is science, using science and technology. And the United Nations Environmental Program has what they call the, um, the broken bridge between science and policy as one of their number four goals, one of their key goals to remedy. See, when we hear inconvenient truths, to borrow from Al Gore, um, instead of looking at our own actions and examining the evidence, we often criticize the science and argue with the scientists um, and perhaps attack them personally. So one of the key things that we need to do is to rebuild this broken bridge between science and policy. We, after all, have very scarce resources to invest in our sustainable development. And we want to invest that money, those resources, where they will do the most good. And I think we should be looking at evidence-based solutions there. So we should be trying to mend this bridge. Another reason for that is that we do expect technology to rescue us. Quite a lot of people say, well, technology is going to fix up the environment. No need for us to worry. It'll fix up some of these other goals. But we do need to rebuild those bridges. And of course, global ethics are another big issue. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion today at this conference about uh, morals and ethics and doing the right thing. Now, <clears throat> it's very pleasing to see that these goals in relatively recent times have been set and acted upon, and in particular, measured because we can moan about things being bad, but it really helps if we measure them. And the things that get measured tend to be what get done, what get attention. Now, the World Millennium Report this year uh, has some good news. Um, extreme poverty, that's where people live on $1.25 or less a day, seems to be being reduced, has been halved since 1990. And there's improvement in access to clean water, to health care, and the number of malnourished people has reduced. So all that is good. And if we see what Jeffrey Sachs, professor at Columbia University and head of the Earth Institute, has to say about this, he says that growth, economic growth, and a market economy are vital if we're going to solve these problems. We need the growth in order to be able to pay for some of the uh, investments that we need to make. Government is necessary, as Dr. Hazer said, and a public and private collaboration are necessary. So many different voices are calling for this. And so it's not just government's responsibility, it's also private responsibility, private sector. So in thinking about this, I came up with a group of stakeholders, and I'm sure you can all add to this group, but these are groups who in some ways have contributed to the problems and who should be involved in fixing these problems. And I'd just like to pick on a few of these groups. The first one is investors. And investors, in a sense, reward bad companies by investing in them. They reward Investors have an enormous amount of power, whether they're institutional investors or even individual investors can make this kind of decision too, to invest in companies that do take account of sustainable practices, both within their company and also outside in terms of sustainable development. So I think investors are an enormously powerful group and there are increasing numbers of investment funds that are looking to invest their own money in sustainable equities, in su sustainable facilities, and other sustainable um, uh, investments. So investors. The second group I'd like to pick on, this is a, the sector that I come from, which is the university sector. And at our research institute, Lorne Butt has been researching what universities are doing 
uh, in terms of developing the future thinkers, the future managers, the future lawyers, the future professionals, and just the future intellectual elites, whatever universities produce. What are they doing to educate their students? What are they doing about research? What are they doing about managing their own institutions in sustainable ways? And I think overall, while there are some exceptions and there are some trends beginning, we can probably describe it as failing the future. So I think universities and business schools really need to look very hard at their curricula, their research, and the way they manage their entire organizations. And as I do say, there are some exceptions, and they're ones who can be very proud. A third group I'd like to pick on are the scientists. I mentioned the broken bridge between science and policy. Well, it's not all the pol policy makers' fault. I think that we scientists are trained to be very cautious because we could be wrong. And so we don't often speak clearly in a defined way to the people who would like our advice. And so we really leave the final decision to managers and to politicians and so on. And we don't really clearly express what we would recommend to them. So I think scientists should be speaking much more clearly, much more the language of the people they're advising. And the last group I'd like to pick on is all of us. And that is under the concept of the bystanders. Bystanders are people who know something's happening, who witness it perhaps, and who don't do anything about it. And I think that describes many of us. We could certainly be doing much more than we are. So the group, however, that I would really like to discuss today is business. And why discuss business? Well, there are a number of reasons. One is many corporations already form powerful lobby groups. They have enormous wealth, which they use to try to influence government or other kinds of decisions. So wouldn't it be wonderful to use this power and this money for, sustainable, um, for a more sustainable world? Of course, not all businesses are powerful and wealthy, but there is a very sizable number that are. A second reason, and I'm sure we'd all love this reason to be the main one, acting in sustainable ways is the right thing to do. It's a moral argument. And I suspect most managers would like to be able to operate morally, to follow their ethical principles. But they're embedded in a context that often drives them to act in ways that might even go against their conscience. For example, if they have to show continual profits, continual growth, and I uh, can't do that in an ethical way, they may, um, may not act uh, morally or ethically. But if we can't rely on business and on all humans to act in, um, in a moral way, I would like to say there's another approach that we should be thinking about. And that is, it is in enlightened self-interest for business in particular to follow sustainable principles. And the reason is, the research is showing more and more clearly that organizations, not just businesses, organizations become more profitable, if you like, more resilient by considering people and the planet. And that's where I'm driving us towards today to consider some of this. Now, before I go any further, I must say, some business leaders do recognize this and they recognize that it is in their interests to take care of the environment, of society, of their own people, to act ethically and so on. One such entrepreneur is Richard Branson, I don't know if you know this flamboyant British entrepreneur. Most people do. He's always in the media. Um, he likes to dress up as an astronaut for his astronaut program. Um, he also opened a bridal shop amongst his 400 companies, and he dressed up as a bride. But I didn't bring that uh, slide today. But what Richard Branson said is, we believe business can and must be a force for good in the world, 
There's the moral argument. And then he added, and it is also good for business. And that is the self-interest argument. Now, before we get on any further, I would like to introduce a positive note here, and there are encouraging developments. And I'll just give you a few examples. For example, the British government has required companies to give corporate responsibility reports for quite a number of years now. And when a company doesn't do much in this space and still has to put in a report, there's quite a lot of pressure, I think, to start thinking, well, perhaps next year we might have some content in our sustainability report. There are many rankings and indices springing up. For example, in ethical behavior. And I understand that the Thai Chamber of Commerce was um, handing out awards yesterday uh, for this. Occupational health and safety, environmental and social responsibility. And companies are proudly displaying their accreditation or their um, rankings and so on on these indices. And I have to mention the Dow Jones Sustainability Index because here in Thailand, there is a conglomerate which performs very, very highly on this particular index, and that is the Siam Cement Group. So I think Thailand should be incredibly proud of that particular organization and its performance in terms of these rankings. Uh, another development in the United States is the move towards being able to register as a B corporation. This is a new legal form that allows business to solve social and environmental problems. Before that, the business of business was business to make profits. United Nations is also doing something, for example, with its global compact. So there are positive things happening out there. But I would like to bring us back to us. And when you're embarking on a major mindset change, a major transformation of your systems and processes, towards more sustainable outcomes. It's sometimes like climbing a mountain. In my, uh, one of my hobbies is walking and hiking up mountains. And when you're at the bottom of the mountain, you just look at the top and you say, do I really want to go up there? So I'm going to invite you to climb Mount Sustainability with me. And each of us can start climbing sustainability, Mount Sustainability, in our own sphere of influence. So we're not all going to go on the same path, but we're heading up to the top. And here we have a picture of a lady who was determined to go on this rather rocky path, even though she had a heart pacemaker. And I'm not sure what her cardiologist would have said about that, but she really wanted to do this. And as often happens, there's someone at the bottom there watching out for her um, as she climbs. So I'd like to give you an example of a company that did go on an almost 20 year journey climbing Mount Sustainability. And that company is called Interface. It was set up in Atlanta, in Georgia, in the United States in 1973 by a man called Ray Anderson. And in 1994, he started on his sustainability journey. He says it was because customers were asking him what he was doing about sustainability. For this particular company, the mountain peak they were climbing was called Mission Zero. In other words, they wanted a zero footprint. And this was a challenge because Interface makes carpets. And I think many of us know how a resource intensive and fossil fuel intensive, petrocarbon intensive carpet making is. And over this 20 year period, Ray Anderson has managed to transform his company. And this entrepreneur was a very ordinary person. He could have been your next door neighbor. He wasn't flamboyant like some other entrepreneurs are. And he talked to his staff and he told them stories. And one Tuesday morning, one of his staff members, a person called Glenn Thomas, wrote a poem. He'd just heard Ray Anderson speaking and he sent him this poem, which is called Tomorrow's Child. 
So I'd like you to hear Ray Anderson talking, uh, speaking the poem to you. Without a name, an unseen face, and knowing not your time or place, tomorrow's child, though yet unborn, I met you first last Tuesday morning. A wise friend introduced us to, and through his sobering point of view, I saw a day that you would see a day for you, but not for me. Knowing you has changed my thinking, for I never had an inkling that perhaps the things I do might someday somehow threaten you. Tomorrow's child, my daughter's son, I'm afraid I've just begun to think of you and of your good, though always having known I should. Begin, I will, to weigh the cost of what I squander, what is lost, if ever I forget that you will someday come and live here too. And Ray's comment on that was, somebody got it. Somebody understood what he was on about. So Ray Anderson then prompted us to think about what a vision might be for business. And I submit this one for discussion. The vision might be to harness the power of business, to benefit the planet and its inhabitants, while benefiting business itself. So, something for us to think about. But first of all, I'd like to invite you to consider the values that we're operating on. Which value systems should be driving our businesses towards sustainable development? And at this particular conference, there are three value systems which are very closely related. They come from different perspectives. There's the sufficiency economy philosophy from Thailand, there is the moral capitalism approach, which uh, comes from the United States. And there is sustainable leadership, which was born between Australia and the United, uh, uh, sorry, the um, European continent. These three philosophies, if you like, value systems originated in different parts of the world, but they have a great deal of overlap and consistency in them. And before I talk about them briefly, I'd like to advise that they are all based on capitalism. There are different forms of capitalism, as I'm sure the um, comparative economists know, and this might be closer to Rhineland capitalism. The sufficiency economy philosophy, I feel very humble in even trying to explain this in Thailand, but there, I know that there are many guests who are not from Thailand. And this was introduced by His Majesty the King of Thailand um, several decades ago. And its objective was to try to balance capitalism's push for growth with moderation and ethical behavior. And there are a number of components of the sufficiency economy philosophy. And their understanding is quite complex beyond what I can go into today. But it is moderation. And that doesn't mean deprivation. It means moderation, take what you need, moderation. The next one is reasonableness. And this has to do with thinking through your choices and the consequences of those choices. And that links back to this short-term thinking problem amongst the Millennium Goals, that we tend to often just not think through the consequences of what we're doing. And then organizations and people should incorporate resilience against internal and external risks. And there are two other components that belong to the philosophy. One is wisdom. And wisdom is, in my understanding, it has to do with knowledge, to make your decisions based on knowledge, wise in that sense. And finally, integrity. 
So that is one approach, one set of um, values related to this conference. A second set of values, very much linked, come from the Co Round Table, and they have argued for a moral form of capitalism for several decades now as well. They have developed a worldwide vision for ethical and responsible corporate behavior and published a set of principles to guide business leaders. And the third approach is the one that I know a little bit more about. We call it sustainable leadership. And it incorporates and refers to those behaviors, systems, and processes that create enduring value for all our stakeholders. You'll notice a little honeybee there because sustainable leadership practices that support organizational performance, um, we also call honeybee leadership. Honeybees. Um, we used to use other metaphors, but we believe that the honeybee and locust metaphors work in many cultures, and I believe also in Thailand. The honeybee, the honeybee builds community, collaborates, adds value, and adds value to the ecosystem and is really critical to the world. Now, when we came up with this metaphor, people used to say to us, why did you pick the honeybee? Because everybody knows that they're suffering from a virus in some countries. In other countries, they're dying off because they've been poisoned by the toxins that we use in our agriculture and horticulture and so on. But I think it's quite fitting to use this metaphor because what are governments and scientists doing? They are trying to save the honeybee. They're investing and helping and supporting the honeybee. And this is what happens um, when a honeybee company is in its community and gets into trouble, the community gets in and helps them. Now, this is quite different from the locusts. And here we have a picture on your right, which is of a swarm of locusts in um, the state in which I live, in New South Wales, in Australia. And of course, the locust is the insect that starts out generally as an isolate by itself, here we think of business just focused on themselves. And then when environmental conditions are right uh, in, and uh, suit them, they form swarms, hundreds of thousands of these insects. And they end up destroying value in the world. So if they see a nice green field with lots of green shoots, then in their swarms they come along, eat the green shoots, and ha give no thought to what they're going to do tomorrow for dinner. So they destroy value in the world. And the scientists are also working on the locusts. But I can assure you, they're not trying to help the locusts. They're trying to control the locusts and possibly uh, destroy them. So let's transfer these metaphors to organizations. A honeybee enterprise, private, public, listed, not listed, sees itself as part of the wider community, as an inter dependent part of the wider community. They believe that their success depends on the support of others in the community. They are concerned not just about the present, but they are looking at future generations. And the CEOs of these organizations talk about this. They talk about how they want to hand over their organization in good shape to the next generation. They prefer a long-term alternative so the long term is of great importance to these organizations. Of course, they have to survive in the short term as well. And they do measure everything and they know what they're doing. But the focus is on the long term. And by long term, I don't just mean next year. They talk about 10 years, 30 years. One organization I study operates in 30 year cycles. And they do scenario planning as far as they can 100 years out. And this has stood them in very good stead in predicting the dot-com uh, bubble that we had around 2000 um, and various financial crises and so on. For the honeybee, stakeholders matter. Not just the investor or the stockholder, but a whole range of stakeholders. They try to be ethical in their decisions. And that's very wise, ladies and gentlemen, because if you can make ethical decisions, you can protect your brand and reputation and money, 
Money is not the central focus of these organizations. Honeybee organizations tend to do very well and to be very profitable and very good to invest in, but money is not upfront. However, for the locust organization, it's pretty well all about money. Um, and sometimes they have a vision, which is to make money for their shareholders. How can employees get excited and buy into such a vision? Charles Handy, who is definitely not a locust, uh, describes them in terms of the business of business is business. Nothing else matters. And that is very much locust thinking. They isolate themselves from the rest of the community, just like the insects do, until conditions are right, such as when deregulation is there, there is no accountability, no need to be afraid, in and eat the green fields bare. Their thinking is short term, and they are really focused on their investors and not on other stakeholders. So there are quite marked differences between honeybees and locusts. Well, does it matter? And the answer is, yes, it does, because the research is consistent. Research, not just from our institute, but the research from around the world, is consistent in showing that honeybee uh, thinking leads to better outcomes and on multiple criteria. It leads to better outcomes for your departments and teams and your organizations, as I'll talk about in a minute. Also for industries, and we do comparisons of different industry players within the one industry. And it matters at the national level. And I thought that because we were looking at the SCP philosophy here at the national level, we might have a look at some national comparisons here. And Professor Harry Bergsteiner from our institute is running a study in which he is taking numerous indices that rank countries. And he is looking at different groups of countries within those indices. And a initially somewhat consistent pattern appears to be emerging. But I just want to show you the current account balance data. And the reason for doing this is because export earnings per capita, your trade surplus, your trade deficit, whatever you want to, what other terms you want to use for your current account balance, is highly correlated with human development, according to the United Nations. And we're using data that's published by the CIA, so I don't think anyone will want to question that too much, but of course you're welcome to do so. Now, there are certain countries that traditionally have honeybee thinking as part of their culture. And there are other countries which one could say traditionally have or embrace the more locust-oriented thinking. And you get honeybee and locust organizations and thinking in every country, but there are almost institu there's institutional support for honeybee thinking in some parts of Europe, for example, and uh, not in other parts of the world so easily. So what we've done here is take the countries, and you can see we've taken a selection of countries here. Any country that makes its money from gambling or oil, in other words, doesn't do anything to earn its money, really, um, we've taken out. So these are countries that produce something that actually add value. And we have the current account balance per capita because it really matters that Switzerland only has six or seven million people and other larger countries have billions of people and so on. And so if you have a look at the middle column you can, above the first line, you can see that the current account balance for a number of countries that traditionally have honeybee thinking as part of their culture Switzerland, Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, it's, very, it's positive per head of population. Interestingly, Thailand and the European Union as a whole are pretty well around break even. And then we go to some other countries, including the one I come from, Australia, um, and we see that their current account balance per person is negative. So why is this? And why is this when you consider the resources that countries such as Canada and Australia have compared with what resources does Switzerland have? It has lovely mountains. 
has some water, it has nice trees, but not the resources that some of the other countries have. So, so ladies and gentlemen, I show you this to give us some thought that if we were able to operate more on honeybee or sufficiency economy philosophies at the national level, perhaps our performance might improve. Right. I've been talking about this honeybee leadership, sustainable leadership, and I haven't really told you what it is. I've hinted at it. So what I would like to do is to point out that we started off with observations of organizations, in this particular case in Europe, that were operating on diametrically opposed leadership principles from business as usual and from what we were teaching in our business schools in Australia and other parts of the world. And yet these companies were extraordinarily successful. Companies like BMW, Munich Reinsurance, Holcim Cement. It was so different, it was striking. And we have ended up with 23 practices, if you like, on which honeybees and locusts can be distinguished. Now, we thought, perhaps it doesn't really matter if you're a honeybee or a locust. You know, there's some companies that do quite well being a locust. So we thought, well, let's ask the gurus, the management thinkers. And so we found that eminent management thinkers are supporting honeybee principles. For example, Warren Bennis talks about don't have the lonely man at the top of your organization, have a top team. And of course we know that teams are very good at solving complex problems, which is what most of us face. He says, be transparent, don't be unethical, and so on. And you'll see that these are honeybee principles. And then we can go to um, the other side of the, the slide, the right-hand side, and you'll see that there are eminent economists from different parts of the world, Joseph Stiglitz from the US, Will Hutton in the UK, and Michel Albert from France. And he actually was asked by the French government to advise them on whether to go honeybee or locust in our terms, and he came down very, very clearly in favor of the honeybee approach. And finally, we have Warren Buffett, probably the world's most famous, most successful investor. And he likes to invest in honeybees. For example, he owns 11.2 something percent of Munich Reinsurance, which although publicly listed is, operates as a honeybee. He'd like to, I think, invest more in honeybee companies, but honeybees want to be independent of external investors, of external influences. And so honeybees are likely to say to banks and other investors, no, we don't want you in our company. So Mr. Buffett has some challenges there, as all of us do, who would like to invest in many of these privately held honeybee companies. It's okay with the publicly listed ones. Now the research shows that if companies and other organizations follow honeybee principles, they will benefit. So this is where that self-interest comes in. They will benefit by enhanced brand and reputation, enhanced customer satisfaction, staff satisfaction, financial performance on a whole range of criteria, ladies and gentlemen. That was the extraordinary thing because the locusts say, well, we're, we're the ones that make money for investors. Well, I don't think so. The honeybees perform extremely well in that area. And during the global financial crisis, the honeybees stocks were far less volatile much more stable. And honey, honeybee leadership creates resilience. Many honeybees came through the global financial crisis uh, extremely well and went on to record years the year or so after. Now, I don't have the time, unfortunately, to go through all the research, but we did produce a book um, called, originally it was called Honeybees and Locusts and produced for Australia, but it was produced for the international market by another publisher and called Sustainable Leadership. And in this book, we wanted to give managers arguments so they could go to their colleagues, to their bosses, to their boards, and say, we should be operating more as honeybees than as locusts, and this is the reason why. It pays off. So for all the principles that I'm gonna talk about in a minute, it pays to be a honeybee. Self-interest again. 
you don't want to read about our work, fine. Just go online here and um, or companies that one might consider, uh, I'll use the word, locusts, are also now coming out and saying, essentially follow honeybee principles, it'll be better for your business. So this is a series of cases called Sustainability Pays, studies that prove the business case for sustainability. Right. Now, what are these sustainable principles? What's the difference between honeybees and locusts? Well, not quite. The next slide, I promise you. Um, Research-based principles. It's all based on research. The distinguishing criteria between honeybees and locusts are the only things that we've got here. There are some things they have in common, which we haven't mentioned. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach, but it is um, one in which um, you can adapt the approaches to your organization. And I'm going to show you a pyramid where we have foundation practices, higher level practices, key performance drivers that your customer experiences and the outcomes. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the sustainable leadership pyramid. And at the bottom here, we have 14 foundation practices, which is probably the place for companies who want to transform to start. The practices are listed on the right hand side there, but let me just take the first one. This one here, number one, developing people. Honey bees develop their people all the time. They develop everybody, not just the elites. This is ongoing, this is a budget that would never be cut, except in the most dire extreme circumstances. And the research evidence shows that honey bees, um, oh sorry, that companies that invest heavily in training and development outperform the Standard & Poor's um, stock market by between 17 and 34 percent. In other words, by just adopting that one particular honeybee principle, you um, can enhance your business. And the same goes for all the other practices that we have there. So the other key ones are the key performance drivers, the innovation, the um, staff engagement and the quality because that's what your customer experiences. Right. <clears throat> so the question I'd like to plant in your mind is, why aren't we all honeybees? If the evidence is clear that following those principles that I put up there leads to better outcomes for the organization, for the managers and for society, why be a locust? And so I'd like to now conclude with some calls for action. And I'd like to, to again take two groups, the business world and universities. And business, actions for business. Well, there are lots of actions that business can take. But I advise business to follow honeybee principles, not locust principles. And care for the environment and social and corporate responsibility are two of the 23 honeybee practices. So they are already taking care of our planet. What can universities do? Universities, they should be embedding sustainable thinking, whether it's efficiency economy thinking or honeybee thinking or moral capitalism, but this kind of thinking should be being embedded in the curriculum for every student. It should be particularly noted, I think, in, in the business schools. Business schools in particular should be looking at research research into what leads to better outcomes for organizations, research into the effects and best approaches to sustainable development. So there is a lot of work to be done. And of course, universities should be embedding honeybee thinking into their own management styles, I would recommend. It would lead to better outcomes for them. Now, who else needs to act? Well, we go back to my list of stakeholders at the beginning. And I think it's all of us. We're all responsible for sustainable development. We can do so in our own ways, in our own sphere of influence. We can't solve the big problems all by ourselves, but we can join up with others. Or we can do individual things. We can do blogging. We, we can spread the word. We can, as individuals, there are so many things that we need to do. So perhaps an appeal to the bystanders. Let's not be bystanders anymore. Let's get involved in our own sphere and let's contribute to a sustainable future 
for tomorrow's child. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.